I'm Chris Cassie, and welcome back. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Happy Hour with Chris and Larry, sponsored by Art Desk Magazine for the benefit of the Green Box Arts Festival. Hi, I'm Larry Kegwin, and I mentioned in the last episode that I was a choreographer. Back in 2011, I had this wonderful opportunity to work and collaborate with Jason Hackenworth at the Green Box Arts Festival. Yes, Jason is a dear friend of ours. I even tried to set him up with my stepsister, but to no avail. And also, he's the featured artist of today's episode. Jason and I met years ago, and since that time, he's had installations of his unique sculptures at both the Oklahoma Contemporary Arts Center and here at the Green Box Arts Festival. Jason is a visual artist who works with balloons in a sculptural way. One of the delights of Jason's work here at Greenbox was that he engaged with so many community helpers to build his sculptures. It was a delight for them to participate with him and be a part of the creative process. It also helped make our community here even stronger and more tightly knit. Yeah. So back to 2011, Jason also constructed these fabulous wearable costumes all out of balloons. In fact, you know, some of my favorite pictures from the Greenbox Festival are of those sculptures. Can we bring one of those up, you guys? Let's, let's bring one of those pictures up. Great. So here is Aaron Carr, who is a dancer with Kegwin Company, performing in one of Jason's sculptures. It was an audience favorite. Chris, do you have any memorable moments? I do, actually. I remember when Jason filled the rotunda of the Guggenheim Museum in New York with one of his sculptures for the Works in Progress program. It was a crowd pleaser. And let me tell you, people are still talking about it. But probably one of the most all-time memorable installations was in Edinburgh, Scotland for the International Science Festival. It, it was breathtaking. Work in a new medium will also be shown this summer at Greenbox. He's using a new form, inflatables, sort of what your family might have used at Christmas time <laughs> to blow up Santa Claus in their front yard. They're entitled Animal Soul, and they'll take the shapes of animals. I think they'll be super popular with the kids, and I hope everyone has the opportunity to check them out. They'll be up throughout the summer. I echo Chris. You really should check out those sculptures. They're bright, cheerful, and just full of joy. And speaking of joy, I had this joyful experience with Jason Hackenworth when we collaborated together on a new dance for the Works and Process series at the Guggenheim. It was really wonderful. I asked Jason, I said, Jason, can you create a set piece? And certainly that's what he did. He created these mobile balloon structures that the dancers were able to assemble and disassemble the set in front of a live audience. Okay, you know what, enough about us. Let's go grab a drink and see if we might be able to catch Jason on the World Wide Web, shall we? Great idea. Oh, show this. <laughs> Let's chat drinks for a moment, shall we? I've decided today to have a classic gin and tonic with just a wedge of lime for taste, but also as a beautiful garnish, right? So when most people think of gin and tonics, you think of summer. And most times when you think of summer, you think of gin and tonics. But there are so many gins on the market, right? We, we all know Tangeray and Hendrix. But one of my favorites that Chris introduced me to is Brooklyn Gin. Yeah, I love Brooklyn Gin, and thank you for playing the role of Vanna White. You're welcome. Yes. So Brooklyn Gin, you'd think it was, it was manufactured in Brooklyn. It's not. It's actually made in the Hudson River Valley at the Warwick Valley Winery. Look it up. It began in 2010. Each batch is made with 100% fresh orange peel and hand-cracked junipers. I mean, it's delicious. The bottles and cork, as I mentioned, are especially beautiful. Chris, what are you having? Well, Larry, I'm taking a cue from you and keeping things sort of simple today. I'm enjoying a glass of my favorite champagne, Fouve Clicquot. I find it to be delicious and not overly priced. The bottle is beautiful. <clears throat> And if you go um, to their page, Wikipedia page, you can find out about the history of the bottle and why uh, the label is orange and why the bottle is, is green, so on and so forth. But very interesting history. I'd like to also remind all of our viewers that if they go to the credit section of today's episode, um, they'll be able to find more um, on Brooklyn Gin and also on Vluv Clico. Interesting reading on both stories, so please. Thank you for sharing. I can't wait to have a sip. So shall we uh, toast and catch up with Jason, right? Yes. So Jason Hackenworth is a good friend of ours mm. Mm. who's um, living in St. Petersburg, Florida with his wife, Michelle, and their twin and their twins. And he's going to be joining us uh, through video conferencing uh, very soon. 
And so I can't wait to introduce our audience um, to Jason. He is so much fun, and he and his wife, when they just got married, had um, joined Larry and me on a cruise. And, um, well, let's put it this way. They had twins after the cruise was over. And we never saw them on the cruise. We hardly ever wink, saw them on wink. the cruise. That was so funny. Yeah. But anyway, they're dear people, and I can't wait for you guys to meet them. So, yeah. shall we? Yeah, let's go. All right, thank you. Jason Hackenworth is an American artist born in 1970. He received his BFA in printmaking from Webster University in St. Louis, Missouri. He later received his MFA in painting from Savannah College of Art and Design in 2010. He's received numerous grants and is currently a professor of art and printmaking at Eckerd College and lives and works in St. Petersburg, Florida. You may have seen some of Jason's sculptures this summer at the Greenbox 2020 Festival. This work titled Animal Soul was created in 2017 and originally exhibited in Los Angeles. It consists of three large scale internally lit inflatable sculptures. They're joyful and fun. Animal Soul was purchased by the Kirkpatrick Foundation in 2019. It was installed over the 4th of July weekend here in Green Mountain Falls and will also be viewable over the Labor Day weekend. Back in 2011, Hackenworth produced this sculpture. This was featured in the Church in the Wildwood. The audience loved it. Also in 2011, Hackenworth created wearable works that were utilized by the performers and visitors alike. Hackenworth has had been exhibited all over the world at the Victoria Albert Museum in London, the National Gallery of Scotland, and the Guggenheim Museum of Art in New York, among many others. This one consists of 6,000 balloons and was installed for one night only at the Guggenheim for the gala celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Works in Process Performing Arts Series. Hackenworth says he has been influenced by Alexander Calder, Anish Kapoor, and Cy Twombly. The scale and scope of the animal soul pieces can be seen in all three of these examples. Enjoy. Cheers. Salute. Cheers, Jason. Cheers, Jason. Hmm. So, Jason, thanks for taking the time to video conference with us today. I really appreciate it. A few questions right off the bat. Where are you calling from? Hi, Chris. Hi, Larry. Oh, heaven on earth. <laughs> Uh, I'm in my studio in, uh, in St. Petersburg, Florida. Oh my gosh. Now, who do you have with you? Uh, it's my kids were just checking in. They, they barge in here on me sometimes to see what I'm doing and, you know, try to, <laughs> try to, no, no. Okay. Right, bye. To try to make some marks on my painting sometimes, which is always an improvement, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, you know, Jason, I'm a twin too. Have we discussed that already? I had no idea. Well, I hope that you have apologized to your mother and father. Oh my God, it's rough. Oh my gosh. Jason, why don't you give us a little snapshot of your creative history? And why don't you include a little conversation about your mom? I know she's had a little impact on your work. Well, my mom was very encouraging from the beginning. You know, I'm an only child of a single mom, and uh, we we had it rough when I was a kid. Um, we were super broke, uh, and and mom did everything that she could in order to keep you know keep food on the table. I I started my career ages ago. I'm pretty old. I mean, I know I look fabulous, but uh, I I started in. Um, in the 90s, I, I finished undergrad in early 90s and started grad school late and studied painting and printmaking. Uh, my master's degree is in painting, and I always expected to be a painter, but I was um, I was a little desperate in New York City. Uh, I moved there hoping to uh, to make it as an artist, and when I when I got there, um, you know, I I was making inroads and I was doing shows in project rooms and group shows and I was working in some galleries and um, it was uh, it was exciting but also it was challenging to stand out. Uh, so I started experimenting with balloons just really out of desperation you guys I I would I I had um, a bag of balloons 
that I inflated one night and I took them into the subway and I stuck them around just to see what would happen. And um, I kind of tried to make it look like some kind of weird mold or fungus growing in the creepy, dank subway station by my studio at four o'clock in the morning. Uh, and then as people started showing up to go to work, they were very intrigued and they're stopping to take pictures. And and I, I realized that I was on to something. Jason, I know your work has been exhibited all over the world. What are some of your most favorite venues? And are there any you'd like to return to? Like Greenbox? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course I want to come back to Greenbox. In all seriousness, what a magical place it is there in Colorado. One of the places that comes to mind is Reykjavik, Iceland. Uh, I, I did an installation there and I was amazed at how quiet and clean and amazing the city was. The light, of course, is just beautiful. It's like all during the summer, it's like a sunset all day long, which is just amazing. Uh, but even though it was a big and bustling city, it was quiet, very quiet and just so serene, really special place. Although I will say that there have been some places that I'm not sure I'd return if I had the choice. <laughs> so I'll save that for another conversation. But yes, I would love to come back to Greenbox. So thanks for asking. I'll see you soon. <laughs> Jason, that was great. Thanks for sharing. So I remember back in 2011, you were the um, installation artist, and everyone keeps talking about the work that you created, especially the wearable costumes. Which brings me to last year's installation artist was Janet Eckelman, and she built this incredible colorful string work that hung over the lake. And people kept remembering your work and drawing parallels. So I was wondering if you could shed some light on you know, cross comparing your work with Janet's. Well, thank you for that, uh, for the, uh, and for you know mentioning me in the same in the same sentence as Janet Eckelman. I mean, what a big hero she is to me and to so many. Um, yes, her work is certainly incredible, and you know, if I can draw any comparisons, you know, beyond the colorful aspect, you know, there's the there are the obvious that that organic feel. It's very sort of biomorphic. It almost feels alive. Her work is constantly moving. It undulates in the wind uh, and it's reflective of the light and so on. And, and a lot of those qualities are also inherent in my own work. Uh, but I think ultimately what the works point to is something deeper than that. There's, there's almost a, a spiritual quality uh, in her work and and that's something that I certainly strive for with my own work is the idea that that the work gives us pause and introduces us something that is similar to when we see an amazing geological feature, uh, for instance, at a national park or, you know, you see this amazing waterfall. We, we are breathtaking. And what that means is we, our brain stops for a moment and instead of the incessant compulsive thought, we take a moment to just, to just allow it to sink in and to be. I want people to have a transcendent moment when they encounter my work. And I know that I certainly do when I encounter Janet Eckelman's work. It's, it's quite marvelous. Jason, you know I'm crazy about your work, but I'm curious, are there plans to make work that has a more permanent nature? Would you mind sharing uh, with our viewing audience a little bit of your ideas for the future? I do have plans to make the work. In fact, uh, the Tampa airport commissioned me to create a large mobile for their expansion for this year. Uh, originally, we were slated to deliver in November, but because of COVID, that got moved back. Uh, the project was on hold, but... Now we are back on and they're hoping to receive the two installations by February. So what that means is I started making prototypes and models, uh, small sculpture models using steel and cloth and, and resin. Uh, and they're, the forms are, um, here, wait, I might have something right here. Oh, take a look at this guy. Uh, and so these, these forms 
have a similar quality to the latex sculptures that I make, but they are they are more static. They're they're um, permanent. I have some more of the sculptures around here in the studio. Now these have been hanging around in here for several months, if not almost a year, ever since proposing them to the um, to the airport commission to get that project off the ground. Um, now these things were a little labor intensive to create, but you can see they they do have that organic quality similar to the latex balloons. Um, but these there's you know really. I'm only starting to scratch the surface of these. So I'm looking forward to really getting in deep and uh, seeing where these things will go. Wow, Jason, those all sound fabulous. I can't wait to see your future work. You once told me that you are allergic to the plastic and the balloons. And uh, I'm curious, because I don't know many artists who are allergic to their artwork. Can you shed some light on this? Maybe um, what you heard was Michelle say that she was allergic. So my wife is allergic to latex. But I'm glad you bring this up because it's it's a real misnomer. I, I make these huge installations with latex balloons and then I hear people saying, especially on social media, they comment and say, oh, all that wasted plastic or oh, all that you know waste going into the landfill and all that plastic, plastic, plastic. But that's not that's not the case at all. Balloons are 100% biodegradable latex. So they come from a stand of trees from Indonesia. The latex balloons are a natural rubber material that if they're folded into the earth or put in a landfill, they turn to dirt in a year or so. And the trees, it's a sap that's coming from these trees. So the trees are giving it up no matter what. So if we don't cultivate that sap, it, it's going to waste. But the sculptures that I make, I carefully cultivate any popped pieces and we put all of that where it belongs. After all, balloons are magical and joyful. Come on, let's enjoy. <laughs> Jason, this has been great. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Thanks again, Jason. Oh my gosh. And viewers, please mark your calendar to be, tune in next week when we interview the music sensation and fiddler extraordinaire, Kyle Dillingham the founder of the band Horseshoe Road. And also remember that in the credit section of today's episode will be all of the contact information and social media information of the things you might be interested in knowing a little bit more about. And remember, please support your local artists. And be kind to animals. Especially those pugs. <laughs> Until next time. Thank See you, everybody. You. Bye. Happy hour with Chris and Larry. Scene nine, take one. Cycle. Sorry, my language. Okay, so, oh, gee whiz. You ready for your kick? <laughs> I thought I'd do some warm up, okay? Here is Brooklyn Gin. Now, you'd think it was from Brooklyn, but it's actually not. It's from the Hudson River, River, River Valley, ladies and gentlemen. It's from Hudson River Valley. <laughs> Right, let's take it back from gin and tonic. That was pretty good, though. I was rolling there for a bit. Except Carlos, Carlos lost his eardrums. <laughs> Sorry, right, Carlos. It's, no, you're fine. it's one of my favorites. And you think it was made, made in the Hudson River Valley, but it, it's not. It, it, actually, it is. Larry, stick to the writing. Stick to the cue card. He's just babbling. Do you want to trade? Do you want to trade roles? No, no. Well, I can't do that because I give up drinking uh, gin. Oh my god! Uh, god. <laughs> You're stuck. All right, go. Let's do it again. Ready for action? I'm getting hot under the collar. <laughs>